Before I begin, remember the Masters in Sustainability? <laughs> if you are interested, we're running an event this Friday the 13th, lucky for some, uh, in Building 2 from 2 till 3 p.m. That's just a very small plug. I shan't mention the Sustainability Masters program for at least another 24 hours. However, I was at the FAO last week, so the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, and it looks as if they're going to get involved in the uh, Masters and Sustainability here, so that's good. And it's also quite timely because today we are talking about food and water. Before I start talking about that, a couple of words, or maybe more, about the first assessment. So it's got to be handed in by the 4th of March, which I think is Wednesday, 4 p.m. And Thinking in Systems is the core text. So every Tuesday, I set some reading from that book. What I do is I produce some PDFs of it, so you've got all the reading that you need. But I would also recommend that you get a copy of this textbook. There are copies in the library. If you can't get hold of a copy for whatever reason, let me know, and I should be able to get you a PDF version of the whole book. That said, most probably most of the answers you're going to produce for assessment one are based on the flip sheets. So if you come along to the seminars on Tuesdays and you work through those questions, then you're going to put yourself in a very good position to produce a very good uh, piece of work for assessment number one. The template is online. I'd like you all to use this Word template. I think everybody can use Word. If you can't, then let me know. And then you've just got to answer the questions. Uh, so details at the website and assessments. And then, uh, got any more questions, come see me after the lecture today or after the seminar or drop me an email. So today, what are we going to do? Can we feed 9 billion people? That's the question that people are asking themselves at the moment. Maybe can we feed 10 or 11? Because it's around those numbers that we think that global population is going to stabilize. And if we can feed that many people, if we can make sure that we avoid widespread malnutrition and hunger, even starvation, what could some of the implications of that be? So last week, we talked about Malthus, Malthusian kind of demographics. And some people think that Malthus was wrong. Malthus was completely right when he talked about the importance of exponential functions. So last week we talked about exponential functions. They start off quite small, but they can get suddenly very, very large. And if you've got an exponential process, even if you've got a highly nonlinear process, if that process isn't also an exponential process, then eventually you're going to run out. Rather than around at this point or this point, you can't keep pace with an exponential process. Now, Malthus... He wrote his influential book. Who's studying demographics? You can remember the name of this book. It's on population or something. It's always on something or population, or whatever it was. So Malthus, he was doing his research or his work in publications in the mid to late uh, 1800, in the mid to late 18th century. So when he was getting concerned about population was around the turn of that century, coming up to the 19th century here. And you can see... Malthus's concern was when he looked back in history, he could see there was a significant increase, certainly in places like London, in urban areas. And he was projecting that increase forward in time, and he was getting concerned. He said, there's no way that we're going to be able to feed all these additional people. If Malthus knew what was going to happen over the next couple of hundred years, he would have most probably choked on his cornflakes or whatever he was eating at that time because there's been this spectacular increase in the total numbers of humans. There's been this exponential increase in people. Such that we do look to be topping out around 9, 10 or even 11 billion over here. So in that respect, he was completely wrong. He couldn't imagine the changes that we would see so our global industrialized civilization that would allow it to support this many people. There's lots of different ways you can look at that. Here's just one. So this is some data from the UN Population Division that's going to show the change in agricultural productivity. So it starts in 1950 and goes up to a little uh, few years before today. And on this axis here is yield. And the units of that are kilograms per hectare. So that's how much food is being produced per unit area of land. How many kilograms of potatoes or maize or rice can you produce from a hectare? And if you go back in time, 
then you will see there is an increasing trend. It's not particularly dramatic, but uh, to a certain extent it's sort of flatline, but it's sort of progressively or very slowly increasing. And if you'd have gone back to Malthus's period, then again there may have been an increase in agricultural productivity, but it wouldn't have been anything to get excited about. But something quite spectacular in this respect happened around the 1960s and 70s. There was a significant and a sustained increase in the amount of food that was being produced per unit area of land. And also at the same time, there was more land that was being used for agricultural production. So what that meant is there was a tremendous increase in the total amount of food that was being produced. And therefore, we were able to feed four, five, six, seven billion people. Now, as you most probably know, that was the result of a number of different processes. For example, here we've got a crop duster. So this is putting on pesticides, uh, chemicals that are killing organisms that would otherwise eat that particular crop. So there's a highly intensive monoculture going on there, which in the absence of any pesticides would be eaten by natural organisms. So in one, in one respect, we're defending it from things that would otherwise eat it before we could get to it. This tractor is trailing along some fertilizer. <coughs> Phosphate fertilizers, nit nitrate, important limiting nutrients which you can put onto a field to increase the rate of growth of crops. Many crops will be water limited. So through irrigation practices like this, you take water that you're capturing large reservoirs and then you're putting on the field. And there's also selective breeding. There have been tremendous increases in the amount of food that gets produced through selective breeding. So these, kind of, these uh, crops which are being produced here, basically you're kind of appropriating their seeds. And if you look back 100 or 200 years ago at the common foodstuffs now, if you look at a, some maize or if you look at a potato or cabbage, then the species that these were selectively bred from are much, much smaller. They produce much, much less food for the amount of land, for the amount of uh, nutrients they take up. So these four processes in combination have come to be known as the Green Revolution. And I guess you all study the Green Revolution at school, right? In the absence of that Green Revolution, which required phenomenal amounts of energy, which is the thing we're going to be talking about next week, you wouldn't have been able to feed 7 billion people, and Malthus, in that respect, would have been right. Millions, if not billions, of people would have starved to death. So it's been extraordinarily successful. And I'm sure Malthus could never have dreamt that at this period in time, with this many people on the planet, you could have a significant fraction of humanity, let's say the top billion or so, being able to consume this much food. So this is... Uh, a German family's food budget for a week on average. So they're spending on average about $500 a week and you can see these are all the products that they are consuming. But as you know, we live in a very unequal world and so the amount of money that people have to spend on food and the kind of food that they eat changes dramatically as you travel around different places in the world. So and it is across the pond, across the Atlantic to a family in North Carolina, in the United States, $341. And then if you sample, so these photographs are taken from the Hunger Project. If you sample different families in different countries, you'll note, in the way I've displayed them here, that the amount of money that they're spending on food every week is reducing in terms of kind of normalized dollar costs, and also the composition. If you look at the total amount of fruit and vegetables here, significantly more than the German family, and there are significantly uh, fewer kind of uh, processed foods. Also, you'll see that the same family, or the, the family unit, is increasing so that for $68 a week, uh, in Egypt, in Cairo, it's feeding all these people. Here are in Ecuador, Bataan. And this is a family in a, in a camp in uh, Chad. So the world in which we live sees uh, bountiful excess, really. Tremendous diversity in the kind of things that we can eat. And also a significant number of people who don't have enough to eat. 
So currently the world has about 800 million people for whom cannot get access to enough food so that they cannot fulfill their physical potential, they are unhealthy, and in extreme cases will succumb to otherwise preventable diseases and die. And there's also important limitations in water. Not getting access to clean water kills about one and a half million people every year. And the vast majority of those people that die are young children because they are mostly dying from dysentery and small children succumb quite quickly to dehydration when you are um, suffering uh, dysentery or even diarrhea. So on the one hand, there seems to be a lot of food, but not everybody is getting the food that they need. So some of you have studied this, I'm sure, in the context of food security. So food security, the ability or the uh, opportunity to gain access to healthy and nutritious foods at all time so that your requirements are met. And they talk about it in terms of having pillars, things that you need. Not one of these is sufficient. You need all four. Availability, access, utilisation and stability. What does that mean? Well, here's a cartoon interpretation. Availability. Now, this is a thing that people will typically assume food security is. That's just making enough food. That's producing it. That's being able to crop it, harvest it. But we live in a world where there seems to be, in one respect, abundant food, but there's still hungry people. So that's not the whole picture. The other important pillar is access. Now, access there, I've put a bunch of dollar bills. That could be economic access. Can you afford the food? Not everybody can afford to spend $500 a week on their groceries. So you need to be able to get access to it. You need to be able to afford it. You need to be able to get access to a market. It's no good if you've got the money, but you can't actually buy the food that you need. Utilisation is being able to use the food effectively when you get it. If you're so poor you can't afford firewood so you can't cook the food, or you don't actually have cooking implements in which to uh, cook and prepare the food, then again you're going to be unable to make yourself food secure. And then there's stability. Now stability I've put a, you know, like, a, like a storm cloud, so stability in terms of the weather and climate, but there's also important political stability or economic stability. So these are the kind of things that people are talking about when they are mentioning food security, or what is required in order for people to be secure in their food. So going back to that perfect storm, remember I said that sometime around the middle of this century we're going to have to produce at least 50% more food, gain access to 50% more energy, um, and gain access to 50% more fresh water. But this is the kind of trend that we're looking at in terms of development. So this is the snapshot of the Gapminder application. It shows where we are in 2012. Here's the United Kingdom here. And we've made this, most countries, most countries have made this journey from the bottom left-hand corner where people don't have a lot of money and they don't live very long, up to where we are in the developed world here. And you can see the large countries of China, India, and to a certain extent, certain countries in Africa are catching up. They're following us up into that top left-hand corner. And really, that's what some people are more worried about. They're not so much concerned about the total numbers of people. They're worried about what happens when this long tail of predominantly dark blue countries, countries that are based in continental Africa, what happens when they get up to where we are? So some people argue that we shouldn't be looking at 50% increase in food. We should actually be looking at doubling the current global food production capacity in a matter of decades. Because it's not just there'll be more people, but they will be consuming diets more like what we have. And that important element, or an important element of that transition, is from going things which are largely dominated by fruit, vegetables, to meat and dairy. The impacts that the production of food via meat has had on the earth system is significant and profound and it's one of the things that I'm asking you to follow up after the lesson. There's lots of different ways I can show it. There's loads of stats and figures but I think this way is particularly impressive. So uh, this is from XKCD. XKCD, Randall Monroe, he does lots of comics. And what it shows is the mass of different types of land mammal. So this is the mass, not the amount, which is how, you know, how heavy they are, 
Um, each block, each one of these little squares, is a million tons. Okay? So this big center block here are humans. So this is how much seven something billion humans weigh with respect to all other land mammals. And then these lighter blocks here are our pets and our livestock. So yes, cats and dogs and budgery, no, not budgery guys, not mammal, um, guinea pigs. But uh, most of the mass is actually taken up by a small number of groups. So for example, this one is cattle. So all these blocks are the uh, cattle that we farm. Here are sheep. There's another block there. These are our goats. These are pigs. There are some horses there. Uh, and there's a few other bits and pieces. But what I find truly remarkable about it is the... This is green. It's not being reproduced very well on the projector. But these are all the wild animals. So these are mammals that aren't us or aren't animals grown by us for our purposes and use. And they are scattered around over here. So, for example, this little block are elephants. So you can see in terms of total mass, humans and their animals dominate the biosphere. And that's had profound implications. Habitat destruction, you know, the classic environmental disaster of chopping down rainforest in the Amazon so that you can grow cattle, which can be turned into beef or beef burgers. And so that shift, that potential shift from a diet in which most of your energetic requirements are met by vegetables to a diet which contains significant proportions of meat and dairy are potentially catastrophic. And so to go back to this notion of total impacts being a simple function of impacts per person times the total population, I think there was an error in this slide last week which you've all been very polite about and not told me or you're really not paying attention. It's the former, wasn't it? You're just being polite. Anyway, it's total impacts per person gives you your total impacts. And so what seems to be happening is that we might be stabilizing this part. Population may increase, but hopefully not too much, and may actually start to decrease. It's beginning to decrease in places like Japan uh, and other developed nations. But it's this, impacts per person in different components. So this is just one global kind of formula but really, there's a developing formula. There's total impacts in the developing world, total impacts in the developed world, OECD, non-OECD countries. It's those developing per capita impacts which are threatening to increase. And in one respect, they need to increase. They need to increase because they need to consume more food. They need more energy. They need to undertake some of the process of the development that we've enjoyed, certainly in this country, for the last couple of hundred years. OK. So let's talk about just in terms of simple ability for the world system to grow enough food to feed 9 billion people, somehow approximating the kind of diets that we, in developed countries, enjoy. There's been some very, very interesting research on this. So here's a paper from a couple of years ago, which looked at historical trends. So these little dots are data points. So these are these are the results of people going out and measuring things, either taking surveys or using satellites or remote sensing to look down on the Earth. And what they've been doing, they've made records from about 1960, and here we are today, of the total amount of food that's been produced in terms of maize, rice, wheat, and soybean. And you can see there's that increasing trend, right? So there is that fourfold approximately fourfold increase in agricultural productivity plus the extra land that we are uh, pulling into our agricultural systems. But this is where it gets interesting because if you want to effectively double global food production, then what you need to do is follow those dashed lines up here. So you need to see this much increase in maize, this much in rice, this much in wheat and this much in soybean if you want to hit those kind of targets. But when you regress these lines, when you basically fit a curve or fit a straight line, so it's a simple linear relationship, when you put a straight line through that, these solid lines are where you are, okay? So what that produces is a series of gaps. If we go through to the middle of this century, there are going to be gaps in terms of maize, rice, wheat and soybean production. So we're not going to miss those targets. 
So what are we going to do about that? I think it's fair to say that nobody knows. There's lots of interest in this area, um, and some of my research is taking place in it. You may have heard of it in terms of not just the green revolution, but the greener revolution. Right? So the green revolution was essentially a caricature of the green revolution. One of the things I'll talk about next week is you dig up fossilized carbon, which has got tremendous amounts of energy, you burn it, and with the energy that you can liberate from that, you can basically grow more food. You can produce more fertilizer. You can um, run irrigation schemes. You can produce pesticides. You can undertake industrial processes to increase productivity. But that's been quite bad. So somehow, we need to undertake another agricultural revolution, but at the same back scale in, reduce our impacts, certainly within the planetary boundaries context, at the same time as producing more food. Can we do that? Some people talk about it in the terms of this thing called sustainable intensification. So somehow we need to increase that trend of intensification of agriculture, get more and more out of the same amount of land, but we have to do it in this glorious uh, notion of sustainability. I do it in a way which means we're not going to drive the planet beyond planetary boundaries so that certain important processes collapse and then we're not going to produce any food at all. So when people are talking about sustainable intensification or greener revolutions, I think, in, to be honest with you, what they're actually doing is they're saying, and magic's going to happen. This bit over here, something incredible. There's going to be some amazing piece of technology or some change of the political paradigm that you might hear. I don't want to sound flippant, <coughs> but it's a massive challenge. And I think it's fair to say that nobody really has any idea how this is going to happen. But of course, that's not going to stop us from speculating and thinking about it, in particular, in the context of systems dynamics. Now. <clears throat> Before I go any further, a few moments, or a few words, about system dynamics. You've got to let it go, in a certain extent, and be able to think in systems. What I've discovered is that some of the ideas in system dynamics can be a bit confusing, counterintuitive, and often it's people who come from a physical sciences background that sometimes struggle the most. Because when you do modelling of physical systems, you are immediately thinking in terms of the dimensionality of a flow or the units. Or, um, <laughs> whereas in system dynamics, things are a little bit vague. They are a little bit subjective. But it doesn't mean they're arbitrary. The point of developing a system dynamics model is so that we can think about something in a different way and hopefully gain some insight into it. So last week, I introduced this way of looking at population change, where you've got flows in, a flow of birth into a population, and then a kind of flow of, of people leaving that population because they're dead. And so what we can do, we can plug in a food component. We can say that food, or the food availability, or the amount of food, is going to have some impact on the birth rate, and it will have some kind of impact on the death rate. So what we can do, when we have interrelationships, when, you know, this thing is affecting this, which is affecting this, then you can begin to construct simple functions or sketches that capture the important elements of those interactions. So let's take, how does food have some kind of impact on birth rate? So imagine you've got food. So this is no food, this is increasing amounts of food. These are no births, this is increasing amounts of births. And you might imagine, in a naive, very simple, you know, grotesquely simplified way, that the more food you've got, then you're going to have more births. Certainly, if you don't have any food, you're not going to be able to live. It's very hard to imagine how you could reproduce. So let's say the relationship looks like this. We can do a kind of first order test of that kind of assumption. So these are patterns of global fertility. And you can see, let's say, countries in sub-Saharan Africa have actually quite high fertility, but these are exactly the same countries that have issues with food security. So then you can say, well, maybe it's inverse. Maybe really, the more food you have, uh, then the fewer births you do have. And then you can come to some kind of compromise. You might want to call that a piecewise linear function, or basically it goes up a bit and then goes down a bit. The exact form isn't very important right now. It's just getting some kind of intuitions between the relationships between how do the number of births change 
as the amount of food changes. And you can do the same thing with deaths. When you don't have any food whatsoever, you're most likely going to die, so death rates are going to go up. Is that robust along all ranges of food? Well, no. This is a map that shows prevalence of obesity. So it goes from less than 10% to uh, equal to or over 30%. You can see where the red uh, hotspots are, or even the orange hotspots. And there's an awful lot of variation within countries in these uh, orange countries. So there are quite a few red little uh, epicenters of obesity dotted about. People, as well as not having enough to eat, 800 million, there's about 1 billion people who eat too much. There are about 1 billion people on Earth who are eating so much that they're most really going to shorten their lives or at least undertake some kind of impacts on their health. So then you can imagine a slightly more nuanced function would be like this. So as you get more food, deaths go down, but then they might actually start going up as you have even more food. <clears throat> but what about the kind of interactions or relationships we want if we want to understand these sorts of processes? The reason, or an important reason, that there's been this spectacular increase in the total numbers of humans is there's been a difference between the death rate and the birth rate. And that difference led to more people and that produced that kind of exponential increase which over these kind of time scales had this sudden rise a couple of hundred years ago. So already you can begin to think, well, what is the relationship between food? Does more food make more people or does more people mean there's less food? So you can imagine it in an incredibly simplified way like this. So obviously if there are more people, more mouths to feed, then the amount of food that we've got must go down. But at the same time, if we can grow more food, then we can support more people. But when you look at it like that, something very important is missing. That can't be right. And it can't be right because of this idea of positive and negative feedback. Right. So, if you remember, and if you've been reading uh, Donella Meadows' book, we've got this idea of a positive feedback loop or reinforcing or runaway feedback. So if A goes up, if A increases, that has an increasing effect on B. If B then increases, has an increasing effect on A, and that loop is going to go round. A is going to get bigger, B is going to get bigger, faster and faster, larger and larger. And that seems to be the opposite kind of effect with what the relationship between food and population was, because now if, if B gets larger, that has an increasing effect on A, so A is going to get larger. But the larger the A is, it has a kind of decreasing or breaking effect on B so that the initial increase in B is pushed back. So B moves back to perhaps a set point value or the value it was before we started moving it around. I don't want to sound patronising, but sometimes people get a bit confused about how they should understand negative and positive feedback. We typically think about negative feedback in the context of you suck. That's negative feedback, right? I don't mean it like that. I mean it in terms of these negative or positive feedback loops. So here's a classic negative feedback loop. Who studies medicine or biology? Okay, thermoregulation, homeostasis, these ideas. So there are two components to your temperature management systems in your body. Incredibly fine-tuned negative feedback loop system that you've got going on. So let's say that uh, you get cold. So you get cold and there are, you know, there are sensors, there are detectors in your body that can uh, detect that change in temperature and important um, portions of your brain and your hypothalamus. So it says, I'm getting cold, so what do I do about that? Well, you know when you get cold you can shiver, so your muscles start to twitch and as you activate your muscles that produces heat. You can also and your blood vessels, particularly near the extremities, they shrink. So they reduce the amount of blood flowing around, so that reduces the surface area, that reduces the amount of heat that you're losing. More of the heat gets pulled into the internal organs, and it's really the internal organs that the brain is worried about, because there's a relatively small temperature range over which our internal organs can survive. And there's another process which happens that when we get too hot, so when you get too hot, you notice you start to sweat. So you start producing liquid on your forehead, other pores start secreting sweat. As that evaporates, it takes heat away. 
And rather than constrict, now the capillaries start to swell, and particularly they swell near the surface, just like a radiator in a car that starts to radiate out heat. And those two processes are in balance, always trying to regulate the core body temperature, not too hot, not too cold. So, that's an example of a biological negative feedback loop. That seems to be an example of a negative feedback loop. But that can't be right, because we've undertaken this exponential increase. There seems to have been a positive feedback loop, which has happened to produce tremendous amounts of humans, and also uh, a very sharp increase in the total amount of food that's being produced. So one possible missing component could be the amount of energy that we've been using to grow the food. So here we've got population, and as population goes up, it's going to have a kind of decreasing effect on the amount of energy that we've got available. But as the amount of energy available goes up, then that's going to be able to produce more food, and then you've got this original loop here. So to think about that and kind of run through an example, I'm going to ignore the loop back there. So all I'm going to look at is this kind of loop here. And there's a way in which you can verbalize uh, the route around here. I just want to say this because sometimes it catches some people out. It can be a bit confusing. So, the way it goes is this. As population goes up, as this increases, it has a decreasing effect on available energy. So available energy now goes down. If that goes down, then the amount of food that we've got available is going to go down. And if the amount of food goes down, then the amount of population goes down. Okay. So initially, we tried to make the population go up. But there's an effect which comes back down, which means the population goes down. So that's another example of a negative feedback loop. Numbers of people increased. That reduced the amount of energy that we had. That means there was less food available. That means there was less food available for people to eat. Therefore, the population kind of goes back down again. But it works the other way around. All you've got to do is flip everything upside down. So imagine now the population goes down with fewer people, available energy will actually go up. If available energy goes up, then food goes up. And if food goes up, then population goes up. So now we tried to make the population go down, but the system responded in such a way that it actually goes back up. So again, it's another negative feedback or stabilizing or balancing <coughs> feedback loop. So Donella Meadows, in the book Thinking in Systems, talks about these loops a lot. They're very, very important. They're going to be really important if you want to stay within planetary boundaries, because somehow you need to work with the natural negative feedback systems. You need to work with them. You're certainly not going to get much joy driving against these powerful systems. So does that mean that somehow it's all right, that we should be happy that there's some kind of negative feedback system operating over longer time scales? Well, no. And there's two reasons why. The first one is this thing called overshoot. So we all know overshoot, the idea that we're going to go somewhere, but we don't stop in time and we shoot past. So in a system dynamics context, we can imagine that there's some variable or state or thing that we're interested in, and we want it to get there. And we might apply a force, or this thing might be falling anyway. When you have sustained overshoots, you can have things called oscillations. So that's when it goes past the fixed point, and it keeps going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Now, in oscillations, or you phys who's doing physics? Who studied physics at A-level? You know, damped oscillations. If that's a damped system, then eventually, over time, it should kind of come down in there. You get nice, interesting, more complicated systems. You get orbits, chaotic orbits. It might you know, wander all around. But again, you've got this notion of an attractor. Oscillations can be damping down to one kind of fixed point, but they can also be driven. So if you did study physics, I'm sure you came across the Tacoma Bridge. So who's seen this, the Tacoma Bridge from the 1940s? <laughs> It's a classic example of something called resonance. There's a system that's got some kind of fixed point, but it's being continually driven past it. This is an early example of a suspension bridge. And what's happening to this bridge, it's starting to resonate. There's a strong wind, and it's blowing across the bridge in such a way that it's having kind of a differential effect in terms of air pressure. And that sets the bridge in movement. And the more it moves, the more it sort of catches the wind, which is able to apply more force, which makes it overshoot and then bend back even further. So there's a kind of a 
oscillating process, but it's an oscillating process with an important and very dangerous positive feedback element. Every time it's rocking one way, it's rocking a little bit more, which gives it more energy to rock it back the other way. So fortunately, this person got out of the car. As you'll see, the car wasn't quite so lucky. I think it's going to, yeah. We'll just, we'll just watch it do its thing. So people were very worried, concerned. They thought they'd made this very elegant uh, and well-designed suspension bridge. Suspension bridges are, you know, these elegant structures, not, not very heavy. They're kind of uh, efficient use of materials. But they didn't understand it was something of an emergent phenomena that they would undertake this kind of resonating phenomena under high winds. So one way to look at it is this positive feedback process. And you know with a positive feedback process, they stop two ways. They either undertake uh, a counteracting negative feedback process. Something comes along, maybe some external process, maybe some inherent dynamics means that they reduce that amplitude. Or they effectively overshoot and they collapse. They go beyond the bounds of that system. And as you see, Unfortunately, the wind didn't slow down and the whole bridge, well, at least the central span, collapsed. <coughs> Oops. Right. So, the thing that I think is missing in this context of food security is energy. So it's the thing that we're going to be talking about next week. But as well as available energy, we need to think about where that energy has actually come from. So it's largely come from under the ground geological deposits of fossil fuels. Okay? So we can call that an energy reserve. What's the difference between an energy reserve or resource? Well, that's for next week. But I guess, you know, there's some stuff, there's coal, oil and gas buried in the ground. And then there's a process by which that energy reserve flows into our available energy. That's a mine. That's an oil rig. That's a processing plant refinery. There's a massive oil refinery down in Forley, just down the road. And so as well as this loop here, there's an important process that population has on this flow. And as population increases, it has an increasing effect on the flow from reserves to energy. More people, more energy demand, more economic growth, more speculation on future energy deposits or projects more exploration, more development, more extraction. So as population goes up, the flow from reserves to available energy goes up. Now, what becomes very, very important, or at least interesting to think about, are the respective <coughs> flows between population, between available energy, kind of the stock or the amount of energy that we've got, and the flow of the energy reserve. Because you can see if this one is much, much, much larger than that one, let's say we can almost ignore it, then we've taken what was previously a negative feedback system into a positive feedback system. <coughs> because as the population goes up, it means we increase this tap, which means we're, we're, we're undertaking a larger flow of reserves into the available energy. As more energy we've got, then we've got more food. And we've got more food, then we've got more people, which means there's a greater flow. So that process can go round and round. Now, really, in these little squares, or these, uh, these little uh, symbols and these arrows, there are lots and lots of other sub-processes. There are lots of other little things going on. So we can look at it at different scales. You can look at different spatial scales, political scales, temporal or time scales. But this is an interesting tool to think about. So one of the things, one of the kind of the motifs <coughs> of the module <coughs> is that we can look at the global challenges, see how they interact, see how they affect. And so then next week, the idea is we might be able to unpack some of those interactions. As well as population and energy reserves, you might be looking at processes of industrialization. It's just ways to help us understand, ways to think about it. So let's just say as a first order approximation or an initial assumption that this is some kind of positive feedback loop. Well, it seems to be useful in getting some deeper insights into that tremendous increase in the total numbers of humans. You know, there were tens or hundreds of millions of humans for about one million years, and then they suddenly, in the space of a couple of centuries, uh, 
grow to significantly dominate, in terms of biomass, uh, all other land mammals on the surface of the planet. Some incredible process much has driven that. And actually, when you look at energy consumption, energy consumption is arguably more extraordinary than the change in the total numbers of humans. So if you were to add up all the amount of energy that humans have consumed since 1990, and then from 1990 you go back, back to the dawn of civilization, so imagine every barrel of oil or lump of coal or volume of gas that's been consumed. In the years since 1990, we've consumed more energy than was consumed before 1990 all the way back to the dawn of civilization. In fact, most probably in 20 years, we use more energy than we used in the previous 2,000 years. That's an exponential process in energy consumption. So this flow of energy out of essentially finite Earth reserves has, in a kind of a positive feedback process, produced tremendous increase in energy consumption and also population. And when you look at it like a positive feedback loop system, then you need to ask yourself the question, well, where are the negative feedback loops going to come in order to control that system, in order to make it transition away from exponential growth, or to what extent might it overshoot and collapse? Sustainable intensification, greener revolutions, these are all words, ideas, aspirations, that we will somehow, collectively, generate those negative feedback systems which will bring that system back into control, stabilize global population, produce an equitable solution in terms of the dietary requirements for food security. They're not technological. They're not just in terms of food availability. They're economic, they're social, arguably philosophical, I suppose. The alternative, of course, is that we don't figure out those problems and we let the system undertake its corrective measure, which in that respect would be overshoot and collapse. There's plenty of data to suggest that's quite possible and we're beginning to understand how that would actually happen. So this is a map that's going to show uh, it represents the projected changes in agricultural production due to climate change. So as things get warmer, as global average temperatures increase, there's tremendous variance. There's an awful lot of variation in what we should expect to be local weather conditions. So some places will actually get colder. Some places will get hotter, some places will drier. The kind of rule of thumb is that places that are currently hot and dry will get hotter and drier, and the places that are currently colder and, and uh, wetter, well, they could actually get quite a lot wetter and maybe even a little bit colder. But you're driving the hydrological cycle stronger. You know, um, what this means is that for certain regions, so regions uh, on continental Africa, North America, Australasia in particular, significant concerns about um, agricultural impacts there, is that as you go towards a warmer world, you could see significant and sustained decreases in agricultural yield. And that's happening as a byproduct of our consumption of energy. Nobody wanted to change the Earth's climate. Nobody dug up all that fossilized fuel in order to have an impact on the Earth's environment such that we reduce agricultural productivity. But these kind of impacts may well start being felt just at the same time when we need to effectively double global food production. So that's a classic example of a wicked problem, and it's one possible mechanism by which the current system could effectively overshoot and collapse. Now, None of that is preordained. These are just ways of looking at it, that we can develop system dynamics models that can explore some of the scenarios. They help us understand what bits need to be changed. So tomorrow, I'd like you to read uh, a, an article by John Foley. So John Foley is, um, you could say, an internationally recognized expert on food security. And John's argument continually is, if you want to ensure food security, just focusing on availability is going to be potentially disastrous. We need to be thinking about diets as well as the uh, total amount of food that's being produced. And also, I want you to watch a short TEDx talk from Guy Poppy. So Guy's a professor here at the university, but he's currently a chief scientific advisor to the UK government, and it does a lot of work in, in <coughs> an international context about food security. So these are the details. So it's, a, it's not an academic article I want you to read. It's from Encia. 
but it's very accessible and interesting. You can chase up relevant research that way. Watch Guy's TEDx talk, but then also I would recommend watching uh, John's TED talk, which he recorded a couple of years ago. They don't hesitate telling you what the challenges are, but they give you a good deal of optimism as well. Okay, thanks very much.